Good day, everyone. This is Sean Bear from Siemens. I'm one of the organizers for our masterclass series. To all those who have provided us feedback and have attended our previous sessions, just want to say a quick thank you. Um, anyhow, it's 12 o'clock. Well, let's get started. Our host, Slayer Sampson, is going to round out today's Intelligent Design Control series with risk management, as well as build up to our next series on design excellence starting a week from now. So without further ado, Larry, please introduce yourself to those who are new to our series and introduce the content. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Happy lunch to everyone. Thanks for showing up for lunch with Larry. Uh, so a little bit about me. I'm a director of medical device business processes uh, here at Siemens. Uh, my responsibility is really to help both external and internal folks understand how medical device people use our tools. And so I have a background in uh, medical device, been in development for 25, 30 years, uh, everything from clean sheet design to post-market surveillance. So I used to be a chief operating officer for a medical device firm here in Denver. So uh, just to give you a sense of the background and uh, live in Denver, of course, uh, wife and three kids. And so we're all uh, social distancing like everyone else. No, no skiing this year. So looking forward to uh, getting to the topic here and appreciate your attendance. So uh, this uh, screen has a, uh, a QR code. So if you want to uh, show your, uh, your, uh, your picture app to this QR code, it'll come up with a registration. And the registrations for our next series, which is design excellence. And we'll talk a little bit about the content of that, but essentially that's around uh, design authoring. So we're going to talk about that as we move along. But I've uh, got a few links here too. We've got a LinkedIn contact if you want to get a hold of me. We have a Lunch with Larry LinkedIn group and a Lunch with Larry blog. So if you're interested in any of that, feel free to, to get on and uh, there's more detail uh, around the discussion as a result of those uh, different assets that you have available to you. So looking forward to getting uh, down to the discussion. Now last week we had a, a couple surveys, so I thought I'd just touch on the survey results so that you could see uh, how it goes. Uh, one of the really interesting things, I think this is just the number of respondents, um, but uh, if you're feeling like uh, you're behind the ball here, well, you're not alone. So Word and requirements test protocols and Excel for traceability is by far the most common thing that we see in the field. Actually, I was a little surprised that a lot of the respondents uh, felt they had digital integration of risk control. So um, really what we're talking about today is uh, is exactly that. So some of the people on the call um, have a good familiarity with uh, with the uh, type of um, processes that we're we're talking about today. So, uh, but don't feel like you're the only ones out there. If you have a ways to go, it's pretty common, I think, uh, that people are on this word and requirements Excel uh, line. So, next question was related to interest level. So. Uh, did you enjoy the last one? We're going to ask the same question at the end of this session. And so uh, I had a respondent said they were bored. So apologies for that. We'll do our best to uh, provide you with some content today. The last one was topics of interest. And uh, so we had to put a, these in a Pareto format. So uh, med device regulation was the number one uh, responding uh, re uh, uh, answer. And as a result of that, I have some discussion today about how uh, design control and risk management is related to the MDR updates and specifically post-market surveillance. So we'll talk about that a little bit. One of the next uh, polls I need to ask is uh, regulatory information management. Uh, a lot of people have different views of what's included in regulatory information management and, and what should be discussed there. So I may ask for a little more um, detail there so that we could get to the content you're interested in and then streaming uh, 510k submissions so or streamlining that that process of the top three so uh, thank you for those respondents and we'll uh, get to that in future uh, future meetings so let's go ahead and get to the topic so the value we talked about this last time is really uh, centered on three things so we have productivity or the lack of reuse if we can reuse these artifacts, we should expect a, a dramatic improve, improvement in productivity. Today, we're gonna to talk about the risk management artifacts, and I'll mention as we go through how some of these artifacts could and should be reused. Uh, speed, 
So visibility, visibility and data contextualization. This is a core subject for today, and I think you'll you'll get that as we go. And of course, uh, air proofing and building workflow into uh, the process. So just a restatement of what our values are. Of course, when we get done with that, we would expect regulatory uh, approvals and our ability to hold devices in the field would improve. So those are those are really the the topics we're trying to center the discussion around today. So as I said before, we have product requirements documents, and those product requirements documents are a, a pretty typical starting place. And the problem that we have with that, as we talked about in uh, development of our design definition, the problem with that is the reuse is uh, next to impossible. We have transcription errors and ability to search and sort of build out data models as a result of these types of artifacts is really not possible. So the first step, and this is just to walk us into the risk management discussion, is to build out our design definition. And what we talked about before is design inputs uh, hierarchically constructed, so user needs down to a variety of different product requirements and maybe design specifications. We wanna do that hierarchical uh, deconstruction so that we understand what our definition of good is. Um, and of course, those each of those that flat view of the user needs and the product requirements in uh, sort of deconstruction depth. Those are all verified. Um, the requirements are verified by test cases and validated. Uh, test cases validate the user needs. And of course, we talked about how to link in and uh, provide traceability to product sources. So once that's done and we have this construction uh, that we can add to, now today what we're gonna talk about is how do we put this in the context of risk? And so the 14971 document has a pretty uh, prescriptive way to do this. And essentially what we do is we develop a set of harms to users. And then from that we, so the harm is, is the result and the hazardous situation is the mechanism. And so we define the hazardous situations that can lead to the harm and I'll give you an example of that here in a minute. Uh, when we do that, then we, we have a pairing of a harm and a hazard situation. And what we're really trying to do is get to the place where these orange boxes, which are the requirements, end up being controls. And those controls, control what, what do they control? They're mitigations to hazardous situations, and what they control is the occurrence of the hazardous situation. And so what we wanna do is build out these controls in a way that um, provides us with that um, understanding of how we're gonna avoid uh, the occurrence of a harm. And so one of the problems that you get into when you start to talk about this is this relationship between the controls and the hazard situation is somewhat difficult to understand because we have not only the relationship to the hazard situation, but we also have our variety of different FMEA activities. And so the next slide, starts to talk and, and flesh out how this is actually done, how we wanna do this. So essentially what this slide is, is a uh, breakdown of the different controls and how they relate to the, hazard, the risk analysis. So this risk analysis box is the 14971 compliance document really. And so what we do is we have a harm and we have a hazard situation that causes the harm and then what we try to do is develop a set of controls that is a mitigation. Now, what you're gonna notice here is that we're only using user needs as the mitigation to the hazard situation. Now, one of the things when I talk about risk with people, and we've implemented risk in a great uh, variety of different companies. So uh, Medtronic, ISI, there's uh, AbbVie, there's a lot of different companies that have adopted this. Uh, but I'll just say this uh, right up front, I've never run into two divisions inside of a company, let alone two companies that do risk management the same. So uh, there's a whole variety of different things that people do. Uh, when we're calculating our hazard situation harm combination, the P1 to P2P uh, calculation, some people do P1, P2P, some people just do uh, the occurrence of the harm, which is the uh, P, some people do causal chain, some people don't. So uh, there's also different pick tables. Some people have one to 20 scales, one to five scales, one to 10 scales. So there's just a great variety of different things uh, that companies do. And it's really because there's such a broad product set out there in the industry that 
um, you know, there's there's things that are required for more complicated processes that aren't required for something that's simpler. And so you really want that flexibility in how to implement your system. Uh, so one of the key aspects of this whole discussion is uh, this is a, uh, a construction to show you capability of the system. It's not intended to say this is absolutely how you have to do it. And so I'll give you another uh, example here. Sometimes people use design requirements as direct mitigations to hazardous situations, not user needs. And so I'm going to suggest to you that this is a good way to do it but it isn't required that you do it this way. And I think as we go through this, you'll understand why I think it's better to build it hierarchically than it is to sort of start in the middle. Uh, but just to, just to be clear, as we go through this discussion, what I'm trying to do is show you a capability, not so much force you to do it in any particular way. Okay, so user needs uh, then are mitigations to hazardous situations. And uh, in a second here, I'm gonna run you through an example uh, but the user need then controls the occurrence of the hazardous situation. Then what we do is we use the FMEA activities to inform the next level down. So essentially what we would do then is a use FMEA, and that use FMEA would develop a set of system requirements that assure that the user need would be met. And so the example that I'm going to show as we go along here, maybe we have a harm that's um, infection, and we have a hazardous situation that the device provides uh, or, or exposes the uh, harmful bacteria to the patient. So the user need would then be that the device be sterile. And as we do our use FMEA, we would say, what, what is uh, we're trying to understand here? Well, uh, if that user need isn't met, uh, then the user believes that the device is sterile and they get exposed. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a system requirement that's compliance with the 111.35 document. And so at the systems level, then we're going to, and I might just do a little um, pen here. At the systems level, then what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, provide a system requirement that can be decomposed in such a way that assures that user need is met. So then at the systems FMEA level, right, we go to the design requirement. And now we start to break that down into uh, what, what needs to be uh, included in the design to assure that the system requirement is met. Same thing at the design FMEA level. Now we get down to design specifications. So we might be looking at you know, bag seals or, or bag uh, materials like Tyvek. And what happens then is, as you can see, we have the design specification linked all the way back to the hazard situation and harm. And so what we're going to get here is the ability to stamp each one of these controls with the maximum RPL that's associated with the harm and the hazardous situation combination that this leads to. And so what that does then is it allows us to tag each one of these design specifications that lead to a high harm hazardous situation combination as a characteristic related to safety or a critical to quality characteristic. So this tagging then becomes automatic based on what it progresses to. And of course, once we've established which characteristics are related to safety, those are then run through a process failure mode analysis and we end up with our production controls. And the production controls then get built into the inspection plan and the product realization plan. And of course, our control plan are each one of these controls that are used uh, in the deconstruction of the design. So this, this becomes, by definition, our control plan. So hopefully this is clear what I'm trying to communicate is if we build this out hierarchically, what happens is uh, we have an understanding from the top down, from a systematic perspective, how to control these hazardous situations so we don't miss anything. So now one of the problems you might run into is if you say, I have a design requirement that I'm going to mitigate a hazardous situation with, that, that might be something that's important, right, to do that mitigation of the hazardous situation. But if you don't look at it from a systems perspective, you may miss things. So as an example, I might have a, a sterile, um, let's say the bag seal is the design requirement I'm concerned with. And I say, I'm going to mitigate the hazard situation of infection with the bag seal. Well, what about all the other things that are related to system, uh, system sterility? So if we don't take this as a system, if we don't look at it as a system, and we start mitigating things with design requirements, what ends up happening is we, we create gaps. And so that, that's really why I think it's important to, to build this um, mitigation strategy out hierarchically so we end up with a, com 
a complete mitigation strategy that is, and th th what this ends up being is really our, um, uh, our, uh, the, the things that can happen, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the sequence of events that can happen that leads to the hazardous situation. And so it becomes a very complete plan. So I'm gonna go ahead to the next uh, step here and move on. Oh dear. I'm gonna erase all the drawings. So again, we have this uh, construction that is our deconstruction and the risk analysis. And this is just a different view to kind of give you a better sense of it. So we have our risk analysis that's the harm that has the situation with the user need mitigation. And then the use FMEA, what we have is a set of work items that develop use error per this, uh, what is it, 62366, the usability uh, standard. And so we're gonna analyze our perception and cognition errors, get a failure mode and effect and a root cause which will then lead to system requirements. We do the same thing for the FMEA to the design requirements, same thing for the design FMEA to the design specifications. And then finally, this process failure mode analysis is the end of the line where we finish with process controls and now we have everything in the process that allows us to mitigate the hazardous situation. And each in the discussion as we go forward here, each one of these FMEAs is a different report. That's important because the different reports are filled out by different personas. Typically inside of companies, the use FMEA is done by a usability department. And for instance, design FMEA is done by the design uh, department. And sometimes the design failure motor analysis are three different reports that are done by different disciplines. So mechanical might have a different format than electrical. So what these reports end up being are really user interfaces to fill out their portion of the data model and once that's filled out, what you end up with then is um, a population of the data model that both people upstream can use and people downstream can use. So if you finish, for instance, your design failure mode analysis, now you've built out and completed your set of design requirements and design specifications. Now those design specifications are available to the process people to uh, execute on. So the process people don't need to think about how does this relate to a hazardous situation and a harm because it's already built out and part of the data model. It just, it just comes as part of your work. A very important uh, piece of this is how is it that we have different people engage in the process? Maybe you want to do your process failure mode analysis first and you don't want to do all your harms and hazardous situations first. You're not going to do it from top down. You do it from bottom up. It's a very common uh, situation. So what we want to be able to do is populate this data model uh, as the people are ready to do the work. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some of the different reports. So this is a uh, hierarchical breakdown of the design um, deconstruction. So we have user needs to system requirements, design requirements and design specifications, testing, and I've shown this to you in the past, that testing relates to the level of, of requirement or uh, user need that that is. So if it's a user need, we have a validation test case, and if it's a requirement, we have a verification test case. So really the question then comes, why do we have, why are we bothering with all this uh, hierarchical breakdown, and why are we doing three levels? And the answer really is related to the fact that we're doing the FMEAs to inform the different levels. So why is it that we have a design requirement um, that's associated with the deconstruction of this system requirement? And the answer is really contained in the FMEA activity that's happening between them. And so that's really why I wanted to show this de deconstruction because it explains why we have the different levels. And the, the reason is really so that uh, the work that's happening in the FMEAs has a place to land. So that's, that's really why we have, why we've built it out in, in the multiple levels in the way that we have. Again, very common that people do this differently. Maybe you skip system requirements altogether, you put everything in design, really common that people have different uh, sort of ways that they think that construction should be done, which isn't important to the tool, right? We can set it up any way you want. Okay, so let's talk about risk analysis then. So this chart, what it does is it breaks the different artifacts down. And so what you'll see is we have a, a harm, and this is along the lines of the example I gave you before. The harm is infection. The hazardous situation is that the contaminated device is exposed to the user, or a contaminated device exposes the pathogen to the user. 
And then the risk record, what it does is it pairs one harm with one hazardous situation. And what we do then is we associate a severity with the harm, a P1 factor with the hazardous situation. So P1 is how often does the hazardous situation actually occur? And then P2 is associated with the risk record because we need to understand the harm and the hazardous situation to understand P2, which is how often does the hazardous situation actually lead to the harm? So in this case, the hazardous situation is we uh, have a contaminated device. So if we have a contaminated device, does it always lead to infection of the patient? Uh, probably not, right? There uh, depends on the type of bacteria, depends on whether the, the bacteria is in a place on the device that actually exposes the, the user or not. So you might have a two tenths of a percent of the time it actually, uh, that this uh, has a situation actually leads to that particular harm. And depending upon the harm, it, it's gonna have a different occurrence. So this is one of the reasons we have to pair the risk record with the harm and a hazardous situation because if the harm is different, the P2 factor is gonna be different. And so then what we do is cross P2 with the severity of the harm and that ends up with giving us an RPL or a, a risk priority level. Some people call it a risk index, some people call it a risk number, but essentially how important is this pairing to the safety of the user? And of course, uh, and by the way, this table continues on. We do the calculation in the table and then we show the result, both pre and post mitigation as part of this table. I just, it's too big on this screen. I can't show it on the uh, presentation. So the mitigation control, these are the user needs then that control the occurrence of the hazardous situation. And in this case, the disposable device will be sterile as our mitigation control. So I'm gonna go ahead and bu bump to the next report, which is our use FMEA. Now you'll see that this RPL level, I pulled this from the previous report. So once we calculate what is um, the hazard situation and harm, the maximum hazard situation and harm that this user need is mitigating, then what we do is populate it into the um, FMEA activity. So now we know that we really gotta be careful about this user need because it leads to an A category risk. And what we can actually do then is use this severity in the calculation of um, the uh, use error that's associated with this. So now we go through another FMEA activity. We uh, establish a use error. We uh, determine what the perception and the cognition errors are, what the effect of the failure is, and then a root cause of that failure. And now we end up with a system requirement that the device will be sterilized per this 111.35 standard. So that's the progression. Now the next report is the systems and it's populated with the system requirements and now we end up with design requirements as a result of that. Now in, in our um, project, if I could show you that in the project, if we had time, what I would show you is we're, we're actually developing these design requirements from a document that was shared into the project. So this is where reuse becomes very, really valuable because if we have an understanding of what design requirements have to be included uh, to uh, provide us with uh, compliance with this standard, then we can share that into the project and all this work comes for free. So it's a re this is where reuse really starts to become important because what I can do then at the beginning of a project is say, I wanna be compliant with 111.35, here's the packaging standard, here's the you know syringe standard, whatever. And as we share those documents down into the project, it automatically populates a portion of our risk management. So very important to the traceability. So the next one is really uh, terminal sterility. And, the, uh, and so we're populating with design requirements going to design specifications. And finally, we end up with process failure mode analysis. And so as we build out the process failure mode analysis, what we do is we associate uh, the bill of materials with each of the design specifications. So the design specifications are consumed in the bill of materials. And then we associate a process with that bill of materials and then run through a set of process steps and the errors that can occur to uh, create a problem with those process steps. And we end up with a uh, root cause and then finally process controls. And one of the really important aspects of this is these process controls then need to be instantiated in your manufacturing execution system. So now we have a full closed loop process. We understand completely all the mitigations that are required as part of the production processes. And not only that, but they've been built into inspections and into process controls that are built into your manufacturing execution. So you can't miss 
uh, the bottom end of this, uh, assuring that it's being uh, handled as part as part of your production processes. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. Now, what you can imagine is we have this set of controls, and what I like to say is the risk management is really a negative view of the design. So we're saying, how is it that this design can go poorly and create a problem for users? What are all the controls that need to be in place to avoid that from happening? Well, in addition to that, we have systems modeling, which takes the positive view. What is it that the device needs to do? What it, where, how do we provide value to the customers? And when we do a systems modeling breakdown, uh, we have different levels. So we have an operational level, systems level, logical and physical. And what the output of that uh, evaluation is, it's a set of functions. And those functions then can be driven to design. So essentially what we want to do then, oops, get my thing set up, is use those functions for two, pro, two, uh, for two uh, purposes. The first one is to drive design. So we assign functions to disciplines so that they understand what it is exactly that they're supposed to be developing in the context of the overall systems architecture. And in addition to that, it provides the traceability uh, from the functions uh, to, to the design control. So now we understand from a positive function standpoint what we need and then how that tracks into the flat view of the requirements and how they're tested. So each one of these requirements, of course, would have test cases associated with them and text, test ex execution so that we'd have the evidence that we comply with that definition of good. So now we're, what we're doing now is we're bridging between the negative view of the design and what it is exactly we want the design to do from a systems modeling perspective. So this is also very important. So I'm just going to touch now on, I'm going to push in my time limits here, but why is it that we're doing this? It seems all this seems like kind of a pain to go to all this effort to build this out. Uh, several reasons. One is MDR, post-market surveillance. We want to be able to... Um, handle our post-market surveillance uh, requirements from an MDR perspective. We want to uh, have our 14971 compliance, and so that's all required as part of doing our medical device development activities. And we want to contextualize and visualize the data. So when we do impact analysis of problems in the field, we want to be able to do that in the context of risk to the patients. How, how big a deal is this problem we've identified? And what that does is create a situation that we can respond quickly to issues that are happening in the field. And I'll just touch on this. I'm going to, uh, this is really the new MDR requirement for doing post market surveillance. It creates a system around post market surveillance, uh, kind of akin to the risk management uh, 14971 compliance. And now we need to do this statistical analysis on all the incidents, not just serious incidents, but all the incidents. And so what we end up with then, I'm just going to build this out, is a system that has to look at all the inputs that are possible in the field. So edge devices, so Internet of Things, uh, all the devices that are in field, gathering that data, the production data, our QMS data, so complaint data, customer data from hospital systems, social media. We're going to grab all that data, aggregate it into a data lake, do analytics on it, and provide signals back into our requirements management solution. So very critical to the compliance of our PMS system is an ability to uh, collate all this data, put it into one source, uh, correlate it, you know, join the data in a way that allows us to do analytics, and then provide those signals back into our risk management system. And if we go back to our, our deconstruction here of how we built this system out, now what's going to happen is this field data, so either user injury or device uh, information on hazardous situations, user performance, what happens is these key now into the risk management system. So the occurrence of all this, then we start getting live data back from the field on what's actually happening to the devices in the field. We have system performance, design performance, KPI performance from production data, uh, all the equipment performance at the production controls. So what this really does is get us to a point where we can actually key all this information in, have a contextual understanding of what's happening in the field automatically, right? So we can do the statistical analysis, create automatic uh, alerts, and then we have a place to land it so we understand immediately what the implication is to users. It all, it really speeds up the process. And so all this to get back to, um, so that's, that's really risk management. I'll just stop there. Um, 
this is what we're really trying to do is create this contextual understanding. And so that really completes our design control uh, discussion. Uh, we have the three sessions that we talked about. Uh, design definition, you can see why it's so important for us to understand our definition of good because that really uh, drives all the risk management controls into place. Verification and validation is all about what is the evidence that we have to show that the design complies with our definition of good. Now, risk management provides that context. It ties it all together in a way that will allow us to very quickly understand the implication of things that are happening in the field and also prospectively when we put the device into the field, what we think is going to happen uh, as we introduce it to patients. Um, I also wanted to just talk, touch on what products we talked about here. Uh, I want to be direct in some ways. 95% of everything that we've talked about is really our wiring product. That's 95% of the, of the topics. We also talked a little bit about systems modeling workbench, which is our SysML uh, systems engineering model. We're going to talk about that in a couple sessions with Mark Sampson uh, in our next series. And finally, just a, a light touching of PLM systems, because that's where we trace our requirements into, uh, into the product. Now we're gonna have a, uh, our new uh, poll coming up as a result of this uh, slide. The poll uh, is gonna give you the opportunity if you are really interested in getting more information and or just sort of raising your hand and saying, I'm interested in all this and I, I want someone to directly contact me and we just wanna make sure that we don't miss anybody as a result of um, the webinar. So if this gives you the opportunity just to say yes and we'll get a hold of you right away. Uh, and uh, if you don't choose to do the poll, we'll do a follow-up email and you can respond there. So there's a couple of different ways for you to uh, kind of get a better sense of how you might be able to implement this for, for your company. And so um, I think that is all for that. And now what we're gonna do, uh, just uh, for the future, Design Excellence is our next series. I'd be just thrilled if you would be interested in uh, continuing on with Lunch with Larry. And we're gonna talk about Design Excellence, which is really uh, associated with systems engineering, uh, design authoring, which is all the mechanical, electrical, uh, software, and labeling uh, authoring tools that we have. Uh, we're gonna talk some about improving confidence, so simulation activities of a variety of different kinds, uh, Siemens has a terrific simulation portfolio that we really want to touch on and complex data management and manipulation. And so how do we handle this uh, data complexity in these complex devices? Uh, there's a lot of different um, uh, complexities that are associated with that and we want to sort of touch on all those. Uh, just to be clear, the next session that we have is going to be a discussion about uh, sort of what is design excellence, but we're going to put it in the context I have a new project that we're starting, very excited about that. It's the COVID um, uh, vent open source ventilator project. And what we're gonna be doing over the next couple months is building out a system, a cross-platform system that's gonna show you how to develop design controls through design authoring of a variety of different disciplines, all the way to manufacturing execution and post-market surveillance. So this is our uh, demo project that's gonna go across the whole portfolio and we're gonna talk about that in the context of this next session, which is Design Excellence next, 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 uh, next week. And then the first session after that is gonna be model-based systems engineering with Mark Sampson. So we're gonna talk right at the front end about how to drive uh, this new ventilator project with uh, model-based systems engineering and how that works. So very excited about all those topics, and I think that pretty much touches on everything. So Sean, I think that's, I think we're just about there. Um, Thanks, Larry. Yeah, as far as next steps, we'd love for you guys to join us for our next series, uh, which builds quite nicely, as Larry put it, off design control. Um, please invite your colleagues, hack your friends and family. Uh, right now is a great opportunity to learn something new. Um, and then to register, of course, you've got the QR code. I put the link in the chat box. It's down there below. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, other than that, I mean, I'm gonna go ahead and share the poll right now. I tried to share it earlier, but it took the whole screen, so I closed it. But um, if anyone's interested, um, as I said, you know, we'll reach out or you could indicate your interest in the poll. Uh, doesn't necessarily uh, matter, we'll get you one way or another. But um, thanks to all those who have joined us the last three sessions. And um, thank you, Larry. Um, maybe we've got a question here, let's take a look. Um, yeah, we have one question. Maybe I could just, yep. I was going to type it in, but uh, it said to define RPL. So RPL, 
uh, is just one of the acronyms that people use to define uh, the P1, P2, P process. So it stands for a risk priority level. Some people call it a risk index or RI, risk number. Uh, but essentially what it is is when we calculate uh, that number, it comes from uh, the P1, P2, P process where we say what's the occurrence of P1, uh, what's the occurrence of the hazardous situation. We multiply that times the occurrence of how often the hazardous situation leads to the harm, and that gives us the P level, which is how often the harm occurs. And then what we do is we cross the uh, occurrence of the harm with the severity of the uh, harm, and that tells us how important that combination is to the user, which is the RPL level. So RPL is just a measure of the occurrence and the severity of the, um, of the harm per the 14971 standard. So, but different people use different names for that, for that particular acronym. Any other questions? I think that's the only one I see, Sean. I think that wraps it up. Thanks to everyone for sticking around a couple extra minutes. We'll try to keep it on time next time around. Have a good week. Thanks a lot.